Hi everyone. I hope you're doing okay. I know that most of the world is in some type of quarantine and we here in Austin, Texas, as of midnight last night, went into a shelter in place order. Due to the nature of the work that we do, we are allowed to come into our studio and film. So my producer and I came in and are going to film a series of videos and then go back home to our families. I'm so glad that you have tuned in today. And today I wanna to talk to you about triggers and reminders and intrusive thoughts. If you are in a shelter in place or quarantine type situation, it can really exacerbate things and it can make things very difficult. But even if you're not, and when we return to real life and we're able to kinda of get back into our normal everyday responsibilities and lifestyle, Triggers and reminders are just part of recovery. They're just part of what it takes to heal. They're just part of dealing with trauma, whether you're dealing with PTSD or complex PTSD or just betrayal trauma. The fact is reminders, triggers, intrusive thoughts, emotional flooding is what our community calls uh, or describes when our heart rate goes above 100 beats per minute, we are now flooding. We're not thinking clearly. We're not really understanding the words that are being said to us. We're also not really able to comprehend them. And if we're talking or raging or lashing out, we're not even necessarily understanding what we're saying. We are lashing out in a fight or flight response, and sometimes it's a freeze response. But there is a way to manage flooding. There is a way to manage reminders, even the most awful reminders. For Samantha and I, she had to wrestle with an enormous amount of triggers and reminders, which would then equal this flooding. There were reminders everywhere. If you've experienced one reminder, one trigger, you understand it causes in you this enormous reaction that you're not even completely aware of. And then we as unfaithful, we see it. We don't always see it, but when we see it, we kind of go, uh-oh, and we don't usually have a plan. We don't usually know what to do. And we exhibit responses that are not helpful. Like, here we go again. Or, oh my gosh, now, really? Now this is when you're gonna have this? Or can we just move on? Can we stop talking about it? And the list goes on and on and on. Now, I don't mind telling you that the most intense work with these reminders had to do with our physical intimacy. And they were overwhelming, overpowering triggers that would cause a reaction inside of Samantha at a, an enormously challenging time. I had no idea how to handle it and had to be taught, had to be coached into how to manage them because they were awful for her, which would then cause me to circle the drain and kind of go into my own shame, my own self-hatred, my own helplessness. I would then respond. Sometimes I would get mad at Samantha. I would oftentimes get mad at God. I would every single time, get mad at myself, and sometimes even damage myself emotionally to the point where it caused this upheaval, not just in our attempt to reclaim our physical intimacy, but just in everyday life. So today I wanna to help both of you, unfaithful and betrayed, with one of the most effective things that you can do. Here's the strategy that was a complete game changer for us and really helped me, but significantly also helped Samantha. What we did was at a calm time, at a time where the waters were very calm, at a time when we were doing well. See, it's counterintuitive. We think, man, things are going great. Let's not talk about anything to do with infidelity. Let's certainly not bring up anything that could trigger him or her. Let's just enjoy the moment. And I gotta tell you, that's one of the worst things that you can do if you wanna gain ground. One of the best things that you can do is say, okay, it's a good time right now. We've had some good moments. It's not the first and only good time, but we've had some good momentum, maybe today or this week or what have you. And you basically sit down and say, okay, I want to establish a plan 
for when reminders come. Blame me if you like, because reminders are going to come. Triggers are going to come. Flooding is going to happen. If you think that it's not going to happen, you're fooling yourself and you're in denial. So bring the fight to the reminders and triggers and sit with your significant other and say, look, they're going to come and they're going to come again, and I want to be able to help you as an unfaithful manage them. What would make you feel safe when you're flooding? What would make you feel cared for? What would help you diffuse them? How can I be present with you and not make it about me, but make it about you and not make it about you meaning, oh, here we go. Oh my gosh, you're such a mess. No, no, no. How do I make it about you by simply saying, what can I do in those moments? You can also say, tell me what you feel in those moments. Help me understand what's going on. And you may as a betrayed say, I don't even really know what's going on. Well, Tell me what you felt the other day when you felt triggered and flooded. And it's probably an an enormous amount of uncertainty, but intense anger, rage, frustration, hurt, all of those things. There's nothing wrong with simply talking about how you were feeling as a betrayed when you were flooded and helping the unfaithful understand that you probably don't even know. You probably, it's, it's so fast. It's not like you can go, honey, I think I'm about to be triggered. My heart rate is going to explode and I'm probably going to say some things I'm going to regret and I'd like you to be aware that intense flooding is coming. It doesn't work that way. That's absurd. But what you can do is take some of the power back. And actually as a betrayed, you can sit with your unfaithful and say, this helps me feel safe when you do this, when you do that. When you do this, I don't feel safe. I feel even angrier. It causes me to feel more pain, more hurt, more rage. When you do these things, I don't feel safe. But when you do these things, it helps me. It diffuses the intensity of what I'm feeling. When you use this tool, this unties your hands to a certain extent. You're still going to be flooded. You're still going to have these difficult moments. But at least you have a plan in place so that when it comes, you as an unfaithful can try and do what the betrayed has asked you to do. Even though, here's, this is the kick in the teeth, even though it's still not going to be perfect. It's still not going to make them not flood, but at least you have a plan. You can mitigate this level 10 disaster, maybe bring it down to a five. You can at least not leave them in their pain and vacate the situation and do more damage. You see, as an unfaithful, when you do this, it shows that you care. It shows that you are getting outside of your own world and thinking about someone else. It shows empathy. It shows respect. It shows wisdom because you know that reminders are going to come. You understand. It shows that you want to connect with them because you are trying to understand their world. Some of you may say, Samuel, there's no way I'm going to do that. They will cut my head off. Well, is what you're doing working now? Can it get much worse? Why not try and be strategic? Why not try and be helpful? Why not try and actually anticipate the reminders that are going to come and try and make a way to be a safe person for their emotion? Because I'm telling you, if you can be safe for them, you will minimize the length of the flooding episode and you will be able to connect with them in the middle of the most ungodly pain they've probably ever felt next to D-Day. Going back to Samantha and I's struggle, there were some really enormously emotional, challenging moments, especially when we were trying to be physically intimate and reclaim that territory for us. Sometimes Samantha just needed to be alone to cry. Sometimes she needed to be alone to self-soothe her emotions and her mental chaos. And I would feel helpless and I hate to feel helpless, so I would actually try and engage her. And I learned, no, 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 giving her space is not bad. Giving her space is not abandoning her. That's what she wants. And so when we had our conversations about how to mitigate some of the intensity, she would say, you know, sometimes I need to be alone. I don't feel that you're abandoning me. I don't feel that you are being selfish. I need to get away from you to calm myself down. And I would say, okay, that makes sense. Sometimes she would say, look, I can't be intimate right now. 
I need you to sit with me and hold me and just be here with me in this moment. Sometimes that meant not talking. Sometimes that meant talking. Most of all, it was about connecting with her in her pain. I wish you all the best. I know it's a tough time. I hope you're making it okay. It's vital that you take care of yourself. No one can take care of you. No one can self-soothe like you can to yourself. It's so important right now to be aware of your own feelings and emotions. Do what you can to take care of yourself and really put the foot down on the gas pedal of self-care. Now more than ever, it's essential that you take care of yourself.